Good afternoon, uh, one and all who are listening to me, the prospective teachers or uh, students or those who are interested in uh, research in this area of biotechnology law. I'm very thankful to Lex Consilium Foundation for giving me the opportunity. My name is uh, Dr. Shashikala Gurpur. Currently, I work as the Dean Faculty of Law in Symbiosis International University, and also as the Director of Symbiosis Law School Pune, which is one of the top uh, uh, 10 law schools in the country, year on and on, and also uh, considered as the topmost private law school in the country. Now, my own introduction to this topic would be that I'm a science graduate especially in biological sciences. I was selected to be a scientist uh, uh, researcher in the Indian Institute of Science, but due to certain pressing reasons, I switched over to law. Um, however, the passion for uh, biotechnology, especially the combination of plant and chemistry and technology did not prevent me from giving it up. So during my PhD, I combined the conservation of biodiversity dimension with the IPR in biotech, especially in plant breeding into my topic. And this is how uh, I come here in front of you. Um, so my PhD research had so many dimensions which came as the ancillary dimensions, which I captured in the form of publications and also tried to connect it uh, in terms of medical law and medical ethics. And currently I'm also the member of Institutional Ethics Committee, which has been registered with the drug uh, uh, Director General of uh, Drug Controller, uh, Drug Control in India, uh, aside from uh, giving uh, final conclusions on many research proposals from the bioethics or medical ethics point of view. So I have been in symbiosis since 2007 in this role. But prior to that, I have worked in uh, SDM Law College, Bangalore, National Law School, Bangalore, from where I got the opportunity to go to University College, Cork. I taught there, then I came back and I continued my work in Manipal Institute of Communication. And later on, I went to Middle East and I was heading the admin and HR department of a healthcare conglomeration. I have been on the editorial boards of journals, membership of various uh, national law schools, research and curriculum development committee, National Judicial Academies Academic Council, Maharashtra Judicial Academies teachers role, aside from being in the Bar Council's curriculum committee, and Law Commission of India's membership between 10, 2010 and 12. I have been privileged to have many fellowships and these have come thanks to my engagement in the international law and biotechnology law. Foremost of them was in Edinburgh Law School, UK's Art and Humanities Research Board Fellowship, Fulbright Nehru International Education Fellowship for the leadership. And then I have been a scholarship holder from my 11th standard itself throughout my graduation. So there have been many awards won by me along with my team for community engagement. Aside from I, uh, that, I also had the IP cell of Symbiosis International University. We generated the first few patents uh, in terms of facilitation as uh, specialized patent attorneys and lawyers. And uh, I have been a successful guide to eight candidates and uh, 12 candidates and currently eight are pursuing. That's the maximum number possible for a professor. But I have been on the PhD referee team of topmost universities like JNU, almost 50% uh, and more of the national law schools in India and many other universities, including a very backward university called Karnataka State Mahila University in the most rural resource of Vijaypur, where I assess thesis in Kannada. I have been the project manager of four European projects. The most prestigious one is the one we got recently, where it is a Jamoni chair on uh, law policy and governance in relation to climate change. And I hold the chair as the chair professor. Uh, my work has been recognized aside from in fellowships and these grants in Karnataka State Government's Kitur Chennama Award for my work with the sex workers. And then uh, also my uh, two books co-authored. One is on agricultural genetic engineering and uh, the other book is on the protection of uh, women's rights uh, in terms of Pune police work. And then I have 15 book chapters to my credit on a wide variety of topics of which biotechnology law occupies a comparative dimension between EU and India. And then I have 81 articles of which 20 are scopus. So this is generally about my introduction. After my introduction, I'll quickly move on to the theme of 
this discussion. So in part one, I'm going to deal with six different dimensions. So the first dimension is, why is biotechnology law, law relevant as a course? Now, I must tell you honestly that uh, when I finished my PhD, I found it so exhilarating as a student that I thought I should develop a course on that. So I would have developed a course on biodiversity law. But then I thought at that time, biotechnology was just picking up. There were a few departments created in some universities. And I was in Manipal at that time when I obtained my PhD. So I was seeing huge flow of grants to the biotech, medical biotechnology department. And it had an eminent scientist from US, Indian of Indian origin, who had many patents to his credit. And when I read his patents, most of the patents were based on either his work with hematology, means blood related uh, medical science, or it was work where medicine was being tested, which was developed from some of the herbal medicines. So that is where my lawyer mind started uh, moving. And I thought that uh, patent obtaining or intellectual property rights as such in conjunction with the scientific departments are in the root of a country's development and they can have the potential to enhance the academic reputation of a person in addition to getting grants for new researchers, including transborder research. So that year we held a workshop in Manipal and we trained about 20 medical scientists and others, pharmacists and all. And within a year, you wouldn't believe so many patents were obtained by this uh, uh, pharma and other scientists. Uh, so uh, this is how the interest in biotechnology um, law came about. And I was convinced with the Dr. Satyamurti, who used to be the scientist from the US, that there was no good scholarship in terms of enlightening the students of biotechnology who are basically science students lost in the lab, talking to them about the interface of science and law, and also in terms of protecting their research, also in terms of ethical dimensions of what is to be done and what is not to be done. So I also was open to the political debates. For example, the second context comes, first context is in the medical science context, where life sciences are uh, influenced by law. Second context is where uh, uh, traditional people's knowledge, as I gave the example, was converted into patent by few and that uh, chemical which was responsible for this unique quality was isolated and then it was patented. So uh, by 2000, we had the issue of Basmati, Haldi and Neem. So I thought that this is something where science knowledge as well as law knowledge is important. Thanks to Professor Marshall, Kar, the eminent scientist and others, India developed a digital uh, uh, data, a digital data library, uh, which is the digital knowledge uh, taken from the uh, traditional medicine and traditional practices. So this is how Haldi patent uh, had to be withdrawn by those who presented this patent because Haldi was a public domain knowledge and it was a traditional medicine. Secondly, in case of neem also, there was a family in Pune, Fadke family, who used to make neem oil, which used to be used as a pesticide. So India had this kind of a whole reservoir of traditional knowledge whereby India could be always living its prior art or prior knowledge in this case, but this was not at all taken into consideration. So I was privy to a lot of these political and uh, popular movements when I was a science student because I was a biology student. So the relevance of biotechnology law for me comes from the lack of justice, lack of regulations, lack of rules, or lack of the understanding of power of science in the lawmaker's mind and laws mandatory role in equating and balancing in terms of justice, the outcome of science not being known to the scientists. So another development which greeted in uh, the early part of 2000 was repeated farmer suicide. And uh, I myself have been in an area where green revolution was happening. During green revolution, a high yielding variety of seeds were popularized by lending organizations and by agricultural uh, uh, village advisors through the uh, state government. Now, what was not done was that there was general scientific uh, data about this and based on that, they would come and tell that cultivating sugarcane is good for Gurpur riverbed. 
But Gurpur River belt's soil condition was such that even if you cultivate sugarcane, sugarcane did not get that relative weight, which if a farmer cultivates in Krishna Basin in Maharashtra would get in the sugar factory. So a lot of farmers who were our neighbors and we ourselves also lost a lot of money by falling into this information trap of science, which was not validated. So we were seeing that this way of interface of science and law in general was an issue. So if you are looking at biotechnology, what is biotechnology? The two words are technology and bio. Bio, you all know, is life. So biotechnology is a combination of scientific technique which manipulates life, which interferes with plant or animal in order to make them useful. So in order to obtain certain uses out of them. Therefore, it has affected all the life-related areas which are controlling the life or which are sustaining the life. Like food is sustaining life and controlling life. Medicine is controlling death and prolonging life and healing diseases. Environment is something where all the life, web of life is interconnected and it is uh, surviving. So biotechnology by interfering through scientific techniques in this web of life or in this intricacies of life tries to see how human welfare and this life's utility to human welfare is done. So from that point of view, today biotechnology is a frontier technology. Any country which is advanced country is advanced in biotechnology. So biotechnology has a direct bearing on the development of a country with the potential for wealth creation because there is a lot of scope for new knowledge or innovation. What is innovation? Innovation is new knowledge which is having a utility and which is having a value. By value, we mean commercial value. So every new patent that you generate, when it is commercialized into a saleable product, it can have a huge wealth generated out of it. So biotechnology from this point of view, today as we are talking is very important because it is very significant for life with COVID-19 in terms of testing, in terms of getting results and improving the medicines and coming out with vaccine within a kind of magical kind of time. This wouldn't have been possible but for the frontier technologies development. It is biotechnology which gives a solution like for example, for the drought region, for the regions where nothing grows, certain algae uh, can be utilized in order to break the rock or which may be growing without water because of which other web of life can be developed. So drought fight is one area where biotechnology is used. So from all these points, for example, we, when we were 10 people for us, two liters of milk a day was enough. But when we became 100 people, we needed 20 liters of milk. Now, how do you generate 20 liters of milk with two cows? Because you have space for two cows only. So you, you generate high yield uh, by means of injecting these cows or by means of using techniques whereby milk production could be improved either by the food uh, or by the rearing system of these cows or by genetically engineering cows, uh, which have this kind of a high quality milk, not only the amount, the quality, quantity of milk, but also the milk, which is rich with vitamin A, which can cure the night blindness, which is major reason in rural areas for blindness in India, or which could be fortified with calcium, which could be fortified with vitamin D. So these are all the areas where biotechnology is useful. Uh, I will tell you later on to make it interesting how biotechnology is not a new thing. It was always there of using this research and the development mentality to the natural products and thereby making enhancing their value for human utility and consumption. One example, two examples I can give. My teachers used to say this, that uh, when you convert milk into milk products, the process that happens is fermentation. In the house, we do that. All women do this, all men do this, uh, because we all like curd and then we like the buttermilk, then we like butter, we like ghee, who doesn't like? So all this is possible when you ferment the milk in a certain way. Now that is a biochemical process. Milk is a biological product. And the way you ferment it, either you ferment it by bringing little yogurt culture or curd from somebody else's house, or you may be just squeezing a piece of lemon and keeping it overnight for the milk to curdle. Or these days we also use the dry chilies 
and keep them overnight and through them the milk gets curdled and then that itself feeds as culture for fermentation there onwards so this is one biotechnological process simple biotechnological process second biotechnological process is a biochemical process like this only which is in terms of uh, uh, you know the suet cat suet is this uh, material which is uh, having a fragrance and these cats are wild cats and suet uh, when it is used for a newborn baby it is supposed to make the baby's nerves expand and uh, very active so in traditional medicine they used to use suet cat now suet cat suet is naturally uh, secreted in its uh, belly button but or uh, what we call as umbilicus but uh, suet's uh, chemical structure was isolated in the lab and artificial suet is manufactured artificial suet may have the fragrance which the suet has but it may not have the natural medical quality or healing property which the natural suet has so this is these are the ways by which biological materials can be synthesized in the lab or converted in the lab to obtain new products or new uses uh, for human consumption or utility so this way biotechnology has got a huge potential for profit and it has got various ways of commercializing and utilizing and uh, uh, thus it poses a lot of challenges to the legal system uh, so in the legal system or in the law it has got challenges or issues for intellectual property like who should own this knowledge of uh, of course traditionally obtained curd and uh, butter and uh, ghee is one but if i am isolating suet from the suet natural suet and i am identifying its chemical composition then i should hold the ownership of that knowledge so this is how intellectual property came similarly if i am uh, if i am creating a copy of suet and some consumer buys it thinking that it is natural suet because natural suet is very expensive and then does not get that utilization or expectation business expectation from the product then it becomes unethical and it could even become illegal because we have a consumer protection act which prohibits any kind of cheating or fraud uh, but if uh, if i am uh, for the purpose of suet if i am going on poaching suet cat and suet cat is on the verge of extinction and suet cat population because it is on the verge of extinction it comes under endangered species against which there is a convention sites convention to which all the countries are parties that is why many times police come and catch those people who uh, who charm the snakes and things like that so such legal and ethical considerations come there for example in uh, intellectual property when the harvard university developed a mouse in mouse was developed who if injected with this certain chemical was able to develop tumors in the body when a mouse develops tumor won't it experience pain but then these tumors are used or these tumors are the targets where cancer medicines were tested cancer drugs were tested before they were ready for release so clinical trial had big use from these mice so these mice which had the potential to develop tumor cancerous tumor were called the oncomice so developing a mouse which develops tumor was an innovation so harvard got the patent on a mouse which could be developing tumors that is why it's called harvard oncomouse now this kind of uh, creating a creature making it undergo the pain and then making it the guinea pig of cancer drugs is something that is not acceptable to the ethical mind therefore where is our morality of non violence where is our morality of kindness to animals and uh, prohibition against cruelty to animals so these are the ethical considerations which come in biotechnology the next point is uh, uh, environmental and business regulations which operate in the case of biotechnology one could be when you are establishing a unit which produces these biotechnology products how those units should be created what kind of compliances should be obtained and how do you uh, look at environmental dimensions etc this is about business 
Now on environmental dimension, biotechnology can create contradictions. On the one side, biotechnological products are giving us a lot of profit. On the other side, these products may be responsible for some kind of environmental damage. What example can I give? Two interesting examples. When you developed these high yielding varieties of rice or areca nut, or uh, let us say high yielding variety of some fruit, the original variety, whom we call as native variety or wild variety, these wild variety become eroded because either you are removing them because they don't yield or th once these varieties come, there is genetic pollution because there is cross pollination between these as a result of which these can get destroyed. The original varieties can destroy. Second, these new varieties are developed in the lab or in a kind of tested field. They are not suitable for all climatic conditions. So those who grow it, for example, now beta cotton is a big controversy because ordinary cotton, when it was grown, then after the cotton was removed, the whole plant was left then and there, which would enter the ground as a fertilizer, which the animals would use as feeder, etc. But if you look at it now, the beta cotton, it could cause poisoning of the field. Therefore, biotechnology law as such, uh, when it is taught, it is looking at knowledge of law and biotechnology, values to be uh, looked at, and skills in the graduates that it needs to cultivate. So we are looking at acceptability of patenting life forms, monopolizing food production with genetically modified forms, risk in terms of these genetically modified materials and other developments like stem cells which are being used or cloning. So the objectives of this course and the expected learning outcome, if you see, the objective is to provide first, as I gave you, biotechnology outline and then understanding different legal uh, regulations which are applied in innovation, intellectual property right, research and industrial growth, and to provide knowledge, values, and skills in relation to identifying the law, enhancing the role of law, and also the national and international dimensions. So the student at the end of this course should be able to have the knowledge of biotechnology, should be able to identify and differentiate different legal regulations, and then discuss the role of legal regulation in both national and transnational context. So we teach them in such a way that students do a teamwork in presenting and then they present, so communication, and then they do good research to do that. And they are able to arrive at an objective analysis and ex uh, expression. And then we look at how do they build the concept? So when they teach biotechnology law, before that they should have a clarity in biology, understanding how biology is different living beings together, where the basic unit is a cell, within the cell is the genes, within the genes is the DNA, which is responsible for different traits of a particular plant or animal. So how these new species can be created like oncomers with these new traits and what kind of energy is consumed, what kind of approach is to be taken, these are mentioned in the beginning. And then uh, different dimensions of biology in interface with technology in the animals and plants is used, such as I gave you the example of biochemistry, molecular biology, and then cellular biology, which goes deep into DNA levels understanding, physiology of tissues and organs, evolutionary biology about diversity of life, and then ecology about how environment comes into being. Now, the last part I want to discuss before I move into details in the next part is, Biotechnology, development of technologies. So if you are looking at biotechnology, it, it has got biological process, it has got molecular process, which is at the cell level, and it has got the cellular process. So genetic engineering is one such dimension where within the DNA, you locate different genes which are responsible for certain traits, maybe hair color, maybe the size of the body. This is how cat fitting into the bell jar, designer cat was conceivable. So this is the part. Now, when you're looking at law, how international law connects to this, how national regulations, policies, ministry regulations connect to this, and how legal regulations are operating in this area in India is main way in which biotechnology law is divided. So when we teach biotechnology law, 
we create and retain interest in the class by uh, telling students uh, to identify the session objective and then we give them examples like how I gave you about genetics, about stem cell therapy. There is also the area of bioinformatics. For example, we had this human genome project. So all our gene genetic information is available there. Now, based on that, you can do two things. One is with the genetic information, you can know after a few years what disease you are going to get. You can make lifestyle changes. Or you can also heal... Uh, for example, Angelina Jolie got her uh, breast removed because she identified that the BRCA gene, which is responsible for breast cancer, she was carrying from her mother. So the potential itself she removed with that surgery. Now the negative side is it can violate the privacy. If my boss knows I have this propensity, they may remove from job, thinking that in another 10 years, I'm going to be very, very sick. So these are the two dimensions ethically, which we have to understand in bioinformatics. So what we do in order to create interest, we give them a lot of pre-class and post-class work, including videos. So I explain biotechnology with these examples, and then I point in the direction of YouTube videos or other special science videos. And after the class, they have to go and see a few more videos. And next class, we will make them speak about those videos with the help of certain questions. Then we give stories, like I gave you the fermentation story. It's not the milk story alone. Same fermentation process is used in the huge way in brewery industry, in manufacturing beer. Imagine the market for the beer, the size of the market. Similarly, in baby factory, as we say, when uh, artificial reproductive technology is used for the couple who can't have their own child, who have a right to found a family, it is technology in relation to human life and medical sciences is coming into interface with the family idea. And then uh, you can give examples of beta brinjal, as I gave you the example of beta cotton, uh, examples in India of neem, of endosulfan victims, or mad cow disease in the uh, Germany and UK resulting in people's death uh, because of uh, feed for the uh, angel dust, which was a kind of uh, feed prepared from the leftovers of the carcasses were used in case of sheep, which jumped the species and cows started becoming mad because their neural system got affected. We had a great example of these boots company entering into uh, a kind of understanding with the Costa Rica University and the same model, the Merck bio model, whereby universities, biological center and uh, a company going together to the rainforest, Amazonian rainforest, and then getting elements from there in terms of what is useful for cosmetics and for medicine, and then getting the profit share. This is called uh, access and benefit sharing. You give access, I give you the benefit, in the products which I patent. Then we had Maharashtra Agricultural Company's case. We had Monsanto case in India. How did this company uh, come to India and how was it able to give its products to the people which resulted in low yield and farmers getting into debt trap? So Vandana Shiva from Navadhanya Foundation has got various videos on this in the YouTube. You can watch some of them. And also there is plenty of research material uh, in sociology and other dimensions. So therefore, it's an interdisciplinary study. So in the lecture, in the tutorial, in the project, you describe the nature of the session. You use innovative session plan and make it interactive. And you map the session objective with the course outcome. You, the objective that you give to the session let us say is to give only knowledge or is to give some skill to how to analyze a patent. So let your whole session of one hour or two hours or a workshop match with that objective and achieve those objectives. Now with this, I finished first part of the video. I'll see you in the second part. Thank you very much.